Okay, uh, this is Nate. Welcome to Rooted in Revelation, where we aim to make God's revelation our foundation and mind, desire, and will. Uh, with me, we have a special guest, Stephen Boyce, and our other guest that's usually with us, Dallas. Um, uh, we're going to be talking to Stephen about, uh, you know, how we got our Bible. We're going to talk about canon and some things interrelated with that topic. Um, so, Stephen, would you like to maybe introduce yourself a little bit to our listeners? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Stephen Boyce. I am a part of a church planning network called City Light Ministries. Um, also one of the researchers and apologists on that team. Um, we're represented on the West Coast, East Coast, as well as in the country of Malaysia. Uh, like I said, we, we train apologists and so forth as well in Philippines, uh, England, uh, Pakistan, uh, and mostly what we do is focus on the current arguments, whether from Muslims or atheists or just a good theological discussion debate. We jump into those and uh, try to write articles or do videos on them with explain apologetics uh, is the main uh, source of that for our YouTube channel. Most of our writings are on our website, whether you're looking at citylightseattle.com or citylightashville.com. Uh, so I've been doing that for a few years now. I just uh, finished a PhD in the area of canon and text. That has been most of my focal point in study. My first doctorate was primarily in theology. Uh, this is my second doctorate. And in this one, it was a focus on the New Testament mostly. Uh, but in the canon, it did range into the Old Testament. I would say about 75% was New Testament. But the other 25% was focusing on the canon of the Old Testament. So this is uh, an area I get talk, I get the opportunity to talk in quite a bit. Um, most of my discussions. It's funny though, a lot of people choose textual criticism when I give them the option, like, well, we can talk textual criticism, or we can talk canon, which they're kind of interlinked in, in some ways. But um, when I asked you the question, I found it interesting that you chose canon, which I'm glad that that one needs to be talked about a little bit more, I believe, in our day and age. Yeah, that's great. And, and uh, yeah, it's funny, I, I guess I brought up canon because I was thinking of Michael Kruger, and I'm sure you're aware of who he is. Oh, and, uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I know he's done some work on canon with Andreas uh, Kossenberger, I think it is. And so I'm, I'm a little familiar with those guys. I've listened to some of their lectures. So, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, James White as well. He talks a little bit more probably textual criticism and stuff. Um, yeah, James, uh, James White and I are friends. I, um, I was on a show a couple months ago. I think I was on the dividing line talking about first Clement uh, oh, with really? him off of my dissertation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he and I did, we've done a couple of uh, podcasts together. Um, we did one on the explain apologetics channel, discussing some of the controversial passages in the TR. Um, and, and we've corresponded numerous times uh, back and forth. So yeah, Dr. White is, is the, um, a good a good guy in that area uh dr kruger i've written extensively on his book revisiting the canon uh, one of my researches was twenty one thousand word research on his book giving a review and a discussion on it um so in his form of uh, canonical criteria uh he uses the three system criteria where i would actually add a fourth to his but i agree with the three that he that he uses right yeah, so I guess before we get a little ahead of ourselves, maybe we could kind of talk maybe a little bit about the basics behind what we what you mean by the word canon. What what sure. does that mean? I guess. Yeah, uh, canon just simply means an authorized collection. Uh, it's an authorized collection of books or literature. Um, you know, just to kind of modernize it a little bit. Um, think about the Star Wars series. Uh, you have an original author of all of this, George Lucas, and he has licensed individuals to work with his uh, company, Lucas Films, for example. And they publish movies, comics, books, and anything that they put out is an authorized work. It's either authorized by Lucas himself or those he put in place to authorize uh, and, and there's really actually there's some really cool stories I enjoy reading in the Star Wars series 
Uh, the problem is, is a lot of them are not Lucas Films. If you don't have Lucas Films on there, it's not authorized and therefore it's not a canonical story. Uh, the same is true in the collection of the New Testament. When we're talking about the canon, um, there needs to be authorized personnel who were given by God the rights to publish the work of God's word and to, to collect that together and to accumulate those words and those writings is where we get our canon. That's where we're, we're searching for when we look for canonical criteria. Right. That's really helpful. So, you know, you know, this, so I guess if maybe you could talk a little bit about the idea, like this book, this didn't just fall out of heaven, right? That's the <laughs> canon of scripture. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what was the process? Like, what would that, what would have that looked like? You know, the early church receiving these, um, these written, you know, books or documents or manuscripts, however you want to word it. What, what, what's that, what would have that looked like? Cause I know, you know, I guess, you know, I know Roman Catholics might say things kind of like, oh, you know, it was kind of, I mean, you know, obviously more about this than I do, but like, almost like they kind of, they pick the books, they kind of have an authoritative role, right? Versus maybe how mm -hmm. a Protestant conception of it is that they would say the books are self-attesting. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that, if that, if that makes any sense. Sure, sure. And, and I guess, you know, the question goes to what makes something authoritative? Right. And does it have to be scripture to be authoritative? Um, and that's where you run into problems where you leave authoritative as a general principle, because there were early church fathers who were authorities in the church, but they did not qualify themselves as the authorities commissioned for the work of scriptural writing. They referenced the scripture as their final authority to decisions that were going on with the churches. So the main criteria that I think you would start in is Hebrews chapter one. Uh, you have the writer of Hebrews saying God at many times and at many ways, he spoke. Theos lalesos is the Greek phrase there. God uttered words. Um, and he spoke to our fathers in times past by the prophets, uh, the prophetes, those that were the instrument and oracles of God that were licensed, commissioned, and authorized were the prophets. Uh, in fact, Zechariah talks about that, that God does nothing apart from his prophets. He doesn't speak to the people apart from authorizing a man who is commissioned with his words to do so. We see this take place in the book of Jeremiah as well. He even used a secretary to do it, Baruch, or an amenuensis would be uh, uh, more of an educational terminology thrown around in, in schools, but a secretary uh, would have wrote and dictated, uh, Je Jeremiah would have dictated what Baruch had written down. We see a story where that takes place, where God says, write down all the words of the prophecy I've given you from this point to this point, write them all down. Um, and so he had Baruch do it. So God gave us his word through the prophets. And so if we're going to have a, a book that is authorized by God, we have to find the prophets in their writings uh, in a written form, not just a oral form. Well, the oral form would have been the case too, but the oral form dies with the prophet. So those that wrote left behind the authorized words of God in a tradition that could be passed down beyond the oral tradition. Uh, and then when we get to the New Testament, that same passage in Hebrews 1, he makes the statement, he spoke to our fathers by the prophets, and in these last days, through his son. Now, there are only a handful of people in the world that have ever heard the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we have to go to the apostles. We see in John's gospel, for example, where he gave them authority, and that he even told them that he would send the Spirit to remind them of things that they saw and heard that basically your human faculties would forget. Um, the spirit will bring back to remembrance and, and guide you into those things and that he would bring things in your mind. So there was this help and this carrying along that the Holy Spirit would bring to his apostles to write. So if it's going to be something that was New Testament, for example, it must have been something that was authorized by the Son of God who commissioned his words to be continued on to teach all nations, to 
make disciples of all nations, to go and proclaim the gospel into all the world, to the ends of the age. And all of those things had to be those that were actually there to hear and license, license to send those words and to publish those words into the world in the different languages. And so if it doesn't go back to an apostle, then we cannot trace it to an authentic source because they'd neither heard nor lived amongst the words and, and life of Jesus. So basically, in a simplistic way, we need prophets, we need the apostles, they must be traced to both to have authentic canonical sources. Yeah, that's great. And, and maybe I was thinking, like, it just popped in my head, like, I, you know, you think of Luke, maybe he was an apostle, or like the, right. the, the writers of the, you know, even the book you're just mentioning, the book of Hebrews, you know, a lot of people are unsure mm -hmm. on who wrote that. Oh, how would the canon relate to people that maybe uh, weren't directly an apostle handwriting it, but maybe someone interconnected with that circle? What, what would that look like? Oh, yeah, great question. Uh, and this is something that comes up quite a bit. And, and Kruger, it is the man has far better credentials and brains than I do. But this is one area I think he, he limits himself in his work is that he mentions um, numerous times self-authenticating, self-authenticating, which is a term I do not use when I'm debating Muslims or atheists on this subject, because self-authenticating sounds like a presupposition. Although I believe scripture self-authenticates, but God used other measures to authenticate his word. So for example, let's use Luke and, and Mark for, for as our two gospel narratives. They're Mark wasn't a disciple of Jesus. In fact, Papias went on to say that he neither heard Jesus nor walked with him. Uh, but Luke uh, was a follower of Paul, and he was not a disciple of Jesus. So how in the world do we you know, bring books like that in, and we'll get to Hebrews in a second? Well, it's pretty simple. We have to go to church history, and we got to go to those that, <laughs> that actually had these accounts and knew these apostles and their, and their followers. Uh, for example, Papias, as quoted by Eusebius in the history of the church, mentions the fact that he received his information about Matthew and Mark, particularly from two eyewitnesses, uh, John the Elder, as well as Aristion, who were uh, apparently a part of the 70, or depending on the manuscript you're reading, 72 in Luke's gospel that were sent out two by two. Um, and Papias being in Hierapolis, having spent time with John the Elder and um, Aristion, and even the daughters of Philip, uh, who would travel and stop to spend time with Papias. Uh, he had multiple uh, statements, apparently, in his five volumes that Eusebius, we unfortunately don't have his five volumes, but all that which Eusebius pre preserved in it, mentions discussions with the four daughters of Philip uh, and how he had learned information from them. And what we know of Mark, for example, from Papias, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, um, Clement of Alexandria, uh, Eusebius, all these early fathers were all in agreement that the book of Mark was authorized by Peter. Um, and so, and, and we see this, and not to, you know, bring in too much of a, a, a boring concept. We see this really in what's called the inclusio eyewitness accounts, a style of writing where you would insert the writer and the author into the story, but strategically. Uh, typically, you would look for who's the first one on the scene talking amongst the group, who's the last one talking. And if we go to Mark's gospel, you start with Peter and you end with Peter. Uh, you see indications that John disguises himself into his starts with himself, not with Peter. All the other gospels start with Peter as the initial apostle, except for, and with, which makes sense, Luke would have been following Mark's gospel, um, and for potentially Matthew's as well, but John doesn't. John starts with a whole different dynamic of how the apostles came around to find and, and meet Jesus. Peter was at the um, expense of his brother Andrew, and there were two anonymous disciples that were with john the baptist who were pointed to jesus which seems to indicate one of them would have been john the one whom jesus loved and he ends the gospel with the story of peter and jesus on the seashore but yet peter doesn't get the last word it's john giving himself the last word which would indicate he was an eyewitness writing his own story with an inclusio eyewitness testament so peter would have 
so Mark would have learned the teaching, sat down with Peter. Peter would have given him the story narrative and he would have translated it into a really clean Greek. Peter probably knew Greek enough to be a tradesman with his fisherman business, but most of what he would have probably spoke was Aramaic. So it's very likely that Mark uh, would have sat down with Peter and had him tell it to him in Aramaic and he would cleanly write it in Greek and, and Peter would have approved it. Uh, Peter probably would have been partially illiterate, if not mostly illiterate. I mean, he was a fisherman. He would have been educated to the age of 12. He would not have continued in the teachings of the rabbis. We see that in Acts when they're standing before the Sanhedrin. Uh, we see Peter going, uh, you know, they said they were ignorant and unlearned, uh, indicating they were not trained by the rabbis. So he would have, no, he's not dumb. And he knew the Old Testament, just read his sermon there in Acts, but that he would have not been as skillfully um, well-rounded with the pen, like a guy like Mark, who would have perhaps been trained better. And then we know as well from Luke's gospel that it is Paul's gospel. All the early church fathers said that. And this is a big debate is, oh, well, Luke's late, much, much late. You hear this. I heard this the other day in my debate with an atheist. I heard it with a Muslim two weeks, uh, two months ago before that. Luke's much, much later. Yet all the early fathers who come from the churches that Paul started are attesting the fact that Luke's gospel was Paul's. In fact, when you see Paul say the phrase frequently, according to my gospel, even Eusebius points this out, that the fathers all understood that to be the gospel of Luke. And this is internally reliable, too, because when Paul quotes the words of Jesus, he's following Luke's account. We see this in 1 Timothy, for example, when he talks about not muzzling the ox when it's treading out the corn. He quotes two passages, and by the way, he calls them graphe, scripture, writings, and he quotes two clauses Attaching those equal clauses to the same noun, graphe, scripture. And he quotes Deuteronomy and the words of Jesus verbatim from Luke's gospel in 1 Timothy 5. So he's quoting Luke's gospel and calling it scripture in the first century. He recognized it as an account uh, Paul would have approved and authorized. So though they were not eyewitnesses, they were scribing and writing the accounts of the eyewitnesses and we know luke got his information from the eyewitnesses if you read his preface very closely he makes it clear that he received this from the very eyewitness uh, accounts of those that were living with jesus and he set in order an account on their eyewitness testimony hebrews for example all the fathers once again held that it was paul that authorized it. Uh, I actually hold to Clement of Alexandria's view. I think that Luke was the uh, writer of Hebrews. I think Paul wrote it in Hebrew and that he kept his name anonymous because he was not very popular <laughs> amongst the, the Jews. Uh, according to uh, Clement of Alexandria, Paul wrote a letter to the Hebrews in the Hebrew language. Uh, Luke translated it into Greek uh, for him. Uh, the syntax is very close to Acts in Hebrews, and Eusebius points that out, in fact, uh, going through the I testimony of Clement of Alexandria. In fact, when I did my uh, first doctrine in, in theology, it was a Lucan emphasis. It was Luke, Acts, and the seminary attached Hebrews with it. I found that intriguing. Um, and after studying the syntactical structure, it's very similar to Luke. Uh, particularly in the book of Acts and how it's written. So again, Hebrews would have been authorized by Paul uh, according to those that received the letter. So those are ideas of, of that. These were accounts based on eyewitnesses uh, and authorized by the apostles. I know that was kind of a long answer, but just to kind of give you an idea, that is a good question and there's good explanation for it as well. Yeah, that's actually very helpful. And and even how you brought up um, you know, the muzzle with the ox and, and the almost verbatim word for word from Deuteronomy and from the gospel of Luke, I think, you know, cause I always wondered about that. I was like, you know, in the new Testament, it doesn't really seem like they're saying much about the new Testament as authoritative, you know, or they're not at least it's, it's more indirect than direct. A lot of the times, you know? Um, well, and what they'll do is say, well, we don't know first Timothy's Paul, it's too right. clean. It's too ecclesiastical. The church yeah, wouldn't have been that structured. Right. That was going to be actually my next question is why do people doubt 
the pastoral <clears throat> epistles and say Colossians. So first, second Timothy, Titus, I believe, and then what uh, Colossians, why, why does it seem like in, you know, 21st century scholarship, there seems to be a lot more doubt on the authenticity and authorship of some of these books? Well, unfortunately, they're making a lot of their arguments on syntax. The, the Greek structure of, say, Titus uh, and First Timothy are different from Ephesians, First Corinthians. Um, and that's one of the biggest arguments against Second Peter, by the way, um, versus First Peter is very, very different. Um, and, and there's good reason for this. And, and, and one of the arguments that's given on First Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles, as we call them, is that the, the structure of the church is too clean. Like, there's no way Paul would have done that. It's too ecclesiastical. The setup is too well-oiled, machined, so to speak. But it's not hard to believe that the church would be that structure. I mean, we find it structured. I mean, we go to Acts 15 and we find the council of Jerusalem where the churches are trying to decide what to do with circumcision. I mean, you have all these guys that are saying, no, you got to circumcise them for them to maintain their Christian status. And it falls over. They're like, "Uh, -uh, we're not doing that. They're not bound by this. And so the debate was so heated. They sent representatives from all over to deal with the matter of circumcision in Acts 15. They made a decision. They came to a conclusion biblically. And they issued out certified letters from the council to the churches that they did not need to circumcise, but to abstain from certain idols and, and, and meats offered idols and things strangled with blood. Stay away from that. That's the conclusion they came to. So to say, well, the church just wasn't even structured. So this couldn't have been Paul. That argument doesn't fly for me. That's pretty structured. But you're going to have world uh, around the world at that time, different leaders in Gentile and Jewish churches meeting in a council, coming together, making decisions, writing certified letters to follow up with that decision. That's pretty structured very early on. And these letters would have been later than that. Um, you know, I mean, they were already establishing leaders. We see that in the Acts narrative. They were starting churches, ordaining elders in Ephesus, and uh, you know, and, and situating and training guys and teaching guys to train more guys like Timothy and Titus, for example. So it's not it's not out of the norm to, to see that that's taking place. Uh, but the syntactical argument is, is a is an interesting one. But I, I, I refuse to make any decision on the basis of a syntactical argument, because there's good explanation for why one book can be different from another. For example, uh, if you were to read my undergraduate work uh, from the time I was 19, 18, 19, 20 years old, I actually started when I was 17. If you read my undergrad research papers versus the ones I just did for my PhD work, you would come to a conclusion we got two different guys uh, over a 10, 12 year period. Um, from the time I was 21 to now 31, my writing has greatly improved my grammar has greatly improved how i would write and structure has improved uh and also if you look at the style and purpose of the writing why is paul paul writing first uh, timothy second timothy titus he's not writing to a corporate group he's writing to individuals who are leading corporate groups so you're going to change your tone you're going to change the way you write i mean he was writing endearing as a father to sons He's not writing generally to assembly like Corinth, who's got issues with guys sleeping with their stepmoms um, and, and getting drunk on the Eucharist. I mean, his tone in Galatians, for example, he's mad. I mean, you want to go find emphatic verbs, go study Galatians in Greek. I mean, he's mad. Like, who bewitched you? Who did this? Like, we're, you were doing good. What happened? Let these guys be a curse. Let it be an anthema. You're going to be writing under a different circumstance to a different crowd, different purpose, and a different attitude. So you're going to see differences. So syntactical reasons cannot be the only reason for this. Also, they'll make the argument, uh, the, the other argument that needs to be made with syntactical purposes is you're using different scribes. Um, I struggled with Second Peter for well over a year. Uh, in fact, there was a time where I wouldn't even read from Second Peter. Um, I had given up hope. <laughs> And I didn't even know how to explain it to people because I was so distraught over the differences between 1st and 2nd Peter and the historical 
um, doubt that was put on it, particularly by guys like Eusebius. <clears throat> and uh, it, it really was a struggle. But if we understand the writings changed, like I just described, and the scribes changed. If you go to First Peter, for example, he mentions Silvanus as being his amanuensis, Silas wrote first Peter for Peter going back to the fact that he was probably mostly illiterate or partially or halfway, whatever. <laughs> um, and then you read second Peter, guess what? There's no amanuensis at the end of the letter. It could be that Peter wrote his own letter. And by the time he wrote second Peter, he was able to uh, get better at writing before his death. Cause he would have been writing it right at the very end after it seemed like Paul was executed. He was trying to be an apostle to those in Rome. Um, and so it could be that Peter got better with his writing and felt comfortable enough to write a personalized letter to this church. Uh, and so it's going to look a lot different from, uh, say, somebody like Silas. And going back to Mark, Mark wrote his gospel. Peter didn't want to write. Um, he was a speaker. I mean, just look at his stories and the gospel narratives. He's doing all the talking. He's a talker. He's not a writer. No doubt, and, and according to the church history um, tradition, they were pushing him to write before he did. They knew his life was in danger. Like, can we get this in writing before you're dead? You know, can we can we get something written down so we don't lose track of what you taught us? And so they moved Mark to do it for Peter, and put, Peter approved it. <clears throat> and Peter was probably not that skilled with the pen, so Mark would have sat down with the uh, papyri and, and 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 ink and said, "Hey." Let's have it. Let's go through the stories. Let's walk through this. And he would have wrote it or have written, excuse me, in a clean, precise, well done Greek versus what Peter would have probably done at that point. Uh, so there's good explanation of why things change. I don't think we can make an entire argument because there's human explanation to differences in syntax. But that's going to be it's not a historical argument. It is a syntactical arg argument. Great. That's super helpful. Um, so Dallas, you've been kind of out of the loop here for a little bit. Do you have uh, any of your, you know, questions that you'd like to throw at Steven? Throw at this point, I'm really proud of this guy for learning all this stuff because I don't know if I can do that. I don't think that's one of my gifts. I really, uh, that's pretty awesome, but yeah, I'm just kind of soaking it in. I'd say I was, I'm a sponge right now. Good. Yeah. Well, with that being said, then, Stephen, why don't <clears throat> why do you think, you know, uh, I guess or maybe I should word it a different way. <clears throat> what, what do you think are some of the most. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is why, why does there seem to be such a more of an attack on the canon of scripture, you know, in our recent, say, I don't know, 1500 <clears throat> years more than ever? What do you think that's coming from? Well, unfortunately, the Protestant uh, Reformation didn't help our cause. Um, there was, even back at that time, disputes. You know, Luther was vocal, more so earlier in his conversion than later. Um, I mean, he, he wanted the Book of Esther gone. Like, I mean, he, had Calvin had very good things, very few things to say that were positive as well. I mean, there was a just a complete disregard for some of the books because of question of authority. I mean, Luther went to question Hebrews and James, and some of that was presuppositions. I mean, he was taught one thing in the Catholic Church, and so he assumed some things that didn't need to be assumed. Um, like his, he had a can, it's called a canon within canon view. It was a theme he had it had to preach christ and i love luther but it's like bro have you read hebrews i mean what we you, where do you not see christ being preached in the book of hebrews um he questioned it and nobody questioned hebrews uh, authenticity except for rome later the catholic church <laughs> the catholic church in rome was the one in the, that that region not so much the catholic church itself but that region where Roman Catholicism originated from is the only location that questioned the book of Hebrews. Nobody else did. Um, and so, 
and which is ironic because I, most of my dissertation work was on first Clement, the one of the earliest bishops in Rome who was trained by Peter and Paul. Paul mentions him in the book of Philippians. Uh, and he actually, he is one of the first testimonies of the martyrdom of Peter and Paul in that letter to the Corinthians. Um, and so he's writing to the church of Corinth that Paul wrote to, and he references that letter that Paul wrote to them, which would, and he quotes from it from chapter one, which would be first Corinthians. And he references it, but you know what New Testament book Clement quotes from the most out of any New Testament book in his epistle about the same size as first Corinthians, it's the book of Hebrews. First Clement, who was trained by Peter and Paul, is writing authoritatively of the person of Christ, constantly using Hebrews as his go-to book. Um, and where was the book of Hebrews only in the world question? Rome. But yet that's not their tradition. That's not their origin. They're early, one of their earliest bishops use it as authoritative writing very early on, and he was a disciple of Peter and Paul. So, again, these things were questioned in the Reformation. They were not questioned prior to that or early on. He questioned things on the basis of his presupposition, what he believed the Catholic Church was teaching. But if you notice, Luther kind of died out with some of that later. And I also think a second part of that uh, answer that needs to be given to your question is that we have a misconception of when the canon was established. There has never been a council that has ever met until the 1520s at Trent that discussed and picked books as canon. Never. No recorded history. The misconception is that the Council of Nicaea chose books. And if you read any of the work at Nicaea, no documentation was dealing with canonical text and choosing them. What they were doing was quoting from canonical text to fight the issue that was brought forth of Arianism. Arianism had permeated into the churches, become per permeating the churches with, with heresy, really. And Arian himself was there at the council. And these bishops were dealing with what do we do with this teaching of Arianism that was denying the deity of Jesus. And how did they answer it? They quoted from the Gospels. They quoted from the epistles. They didn't choose them. They were quoting from them as already authoritative works. So the question has to come to, and when you deal with most Muslims, most atheists, you start talking canon, they're going to take you to Nicaea. And when you ask them the question, I'm sorry, sir, where does the Nicene writings mention these books have been chosen, they can't find them because it's not there. So where did the where did this this idea or these false ideas come from that that Constantine and, and Eusebius and all these guys had something to do with it? Now here's here's my theory. One, <clears throat> Eusebius had a list of books that he categorically placed as received by the churches but never disputed. Then he had another category, those that were received, but yet they were disputed. This would be our book of James and Second Peter. Uh, you know, he had that category, like the churches received them, but there was some argument, but they were no doubt received. Then he had another list, books that were not received by the churches, but they were not seen as heretical. And he, you know, First Clement, Epistle of Barnabas, the Didache, you know, these were seen as read in churches, but they were not. Uh, necessarily seen as canonical. And then he had a fourth category of heretical books, Gospel of Thomas, mostly Gnostic literature. And so he had four categories and he kind of headed up this council for Constantine. So I think people conflate that, that his lists were involved with Nicaea. The second thing is, is a rumor that was started by a man named Voltaire which I'm sure both you gentlemen are familiar with him, at least. Um, I would say you guys are familiar, correct, with, with Voltaire's work. I am, I am not familiar. I am very new to all of this, so <laughs> it's flying a lot over my head, but Nate, Nate might be. I actually sure. don't, to my shame, but maybe you can oh, tell wow. us. <laughs> okay. No, no, Voltaire 
Okay, so Voltaire was um, <laughs> by no stretch of the imagination a scholar in church or doctrine. All right, so Voltaire was in France. Uh, he was a writer. He was a philosopher. Um, in in mostly predominantly the 18th century. So again, like he's not, he's not a a what we would consider orthodox. I mean, I guess he would have been in the Catholic Roman Catholic realm, but he's not somebody who is a part of the church historian scholar like guy. But he had received a manuscript from around the ninth century that had readings in it that talked about a, a decision that was made at Nicaea where basically books were put on this altar. And, and on this altar, if they would, they would pray and ask God to show them which ones were true. And then after they were done praying and picked their heads up, basically whichever books were found on the ground were non-canonical. The ones that stayed on the table were canonical. And so Voltaire gets a, a translation of this unknown manuscript. We don't know where it came from. Uh, it's around the ninth century. There's no evidence of this in any of the Nicene writings or writers or bishops that were there or a part of it, none. It's just this miscellaneous document he got a translation of. <clears throat> that came, I think the earliest of that translation came around the 1600s, maybe shortly after. And uh, it just basically says that's what happened. There's no proof of that. There's no evidence of that. It's just a claim that comes from some weird manuscript. Well, Voltaire writes about this and goes, basically saying it's a pity we lost all of this historical, because he, he loved history. And he basically says it, it's a pity we lost all of these historical writings because they weren't picked. But that's the rumor. That's where all this started. Mostly it's from Voltaire, um, 18th century French philosopher. Um, but there's no record of anything that he claimed. There's no record of that manuscript that's accurate. So that's where these rumors come from. But it must be noted that there are none, uh, do no documents of that in that they dealt with Arianism, not choosing canonical. Typically, what would happen is the church has already had lists of books. Athanasius, on a letter on Easter, had placed all 27 New Testament books that we have as books he had received from the tradition of the fathers. And if you read them carefully, read Athanasius carefully, read the Council of Carthage very specifically in what they say. They never say we chose these books. You look at Carthage later on in, in North Africa, they're writing to the church at Rome. They're starting to get these Gnostic gospels and all these saying, well, this is a letter from Peter, or this is a letter from James. And they're like, eh, it's not the ones we got from the apostles. Remember, these are churches that were started by the apostles. Uh, you know, they, they, they were passed down into these churches. And so they're writing a letter to Rome, Carthage did, and said, Here's the 27 books we've received from the apostles. And they listed them. And they're all 27 books that we have in the New Testament. And they said, check your list. Is this the same books you have that you received from the apostles? Rome writes a letter back to Carthage and says, yep, that's the same 27 books we have. <laughs> and so they weren't asking each other to pick books. And they didn't say, we chose these. They are saying, these are the ones that we received from the apostles. These were churches started by the apostles. They're receiving these letters from the apostles. And they're saying, these are the authentic ones. Forgeries were coming into the church. They're going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This, this, we, we've never seen this letter. It's got Peter's name on it, but I've never seen this. So they start asking questions. Hey, did you get a letter? Are, th are these not the books that you have? Yeah, yeah. These are the ones we've got. Okay, we're just making sure we're getting some weird letters coming in. Um, so... Isn't it interesting that they have the same books without corroborating any type of conspiracies in the early church? All the church fathers are quoting from the same four gospels. Even Marcion, who corrupted the gospel of Luke and some of Paul's epistles, said that the gospel of Luke was Paul's gospel. They knew, and, and, and keep this in mind this is why the Gnostic gospels forge and plagiarize names. Why else? 
if you're going to sell a forgery, you better have an eyewitness name on there. Peter, James, Paul, John. You better have these names on that document or the churches would have never questioned. I mean, because you sent a letter from, you know, John Smith or Billy Bob Thornton or something like that. And you're getting it over here at the church over in North Africa. They know you're not an eyewitness. They're not going to accept your work as, as authentic. But boy, if you can put Peter's name in there or the gospel of Thomas or the gospel of uh, Peter, now all of a sudden you're going to make people have to question, okay, wait, wait a minute. We, we don't have this letter. Now you got to question things. It's a whole nother story now. So that's why these forgeries would use apostles' names because they knew they needed them to authenticate. And that's how you would sell it. <clears throat> so this was a problem in the church, but yeah, I mean, uh, th these are the situations of rumors of where this stuff came from originally. It, it was merely Voltaire starting it and just mis misunderstandings about Eusebius and Nicaea. I just love history. I didn't have anything to say, Nate. Your point at me like, oh, yeah, you. I just love this. You know, I, all this random stuff. I've not learned any of this. I'm so like, this is way over my head. But the fact you can take it back that far, you know, in history and you know all these people's names, you know these accounts. That was good. I yeah, like that. What, what I find so amazing is, you know, a lot of people want to throw speculation on the canon, like on the received Bible we have, you know, and a lot of that stuff comes from, you know, a lot of those, what do you call them, the movies. And uh, uh, what was that one uh, famous book uh, called again? Da Vinci uh, Code? Da Vinci Code. And like this mass conspiracy that Jesus was dating oh. Mary Magdalene and they had a kid oh, and like, yeah. all these secrets. <clears throat> and, and, you know, because there's so many times, like if, if I am talking to an unbeliever, they always ask questions like, well, what about Enoch? What about the lost books? You know, the canon you have isn't the real canon. But like after hearing all the stuff you're saying, it's just like it's incredible the consistency and continuity between how serious the early church took these writings and how much serious, you know, how serious we should take these writings, <laughs> the, the way they were preserved and kept. Um, so would you mind sharing maybe some stuff that has really built up your faith um, with all your studies and all the stuff you've been doing? What are some things sure. that really strengthen your faith and and maybe, you know, for people that might be more like a doubting Thomas and their, you know, Christian walk, you know, I know you do apologetics. We, I, I like talking apologetics as well as part of this ministry we're doing. Um, what are some things that, you know, might help someone out that's doubting the reliability of the canon or things like that? Yeah, this is something that um, if I'm honest, I've wrestled with over the years. Um, I, I admitted to you earlier when... I was studying Second Peter. I I I I went MIA on that book for a year. I mean, um, <clears throat> I struggled with its reliability. Um, I think guys and girls need a battle. I don't think they should just accept something because that's what they were always told. I think they need to study. They need to read. Read the read the earliest witnesses start there not with modern scholars i mean really who i'm not saying modern scholars don't have brains and, and put dots together that are good i mean it's phenomenal material out there for modern scholarship <clears throat> but why start in modern times about an ancient text from 2000 years ago in law and in, in, in the old testament even further start with the earliest witnesses read them Read Eusebius's accounts of the church. Read what Pappy has said about Matthew and, and Mark. Uh, read the epistles of Polycarp, who were trained, or the epistle of Polycarp that was trained by John the Apostle and commissioned as the overseer in Smyrna. And read how many times he quotes the New Testament. See which gospel accounts he's quoting from. See which epistles. He quotes First Peter more than anybody. Quotes Matthew more than any gospel. Read the Didache, the end of the first century document. In a letter the size of one of our smaller Pauline epistles, quotes Matthew's gospel a minimum of 25, potentially 29 times. 
quotes Mark, quotes Luke. Who's Ignatius quoting? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who's <laughs> who's Clement quoting? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and potentially John. W- w- why? That was their authoritative source of the ministry and teachings of Jesus. We need to get acquainted with these teachings and these writings so that we know what they were reading at the earliest points. Do you understand? Clement was trained by the apostles. Polycarp, trained by the apostles. Ignatius, trained by apostolic secession. Uh, You have uh, the same thing is true with um, uh, those that are, are, are in Rome later on in these churches that are being trickled down and trained and taught. Uh, John Mark went down to uh, Egypt after Peter's execution and started churches in Egypt, uh, the Coptic ch- churches. Uh, th- these are things that we need to be examining so that we can strengthen our faith to see that we have more work of antiquity to defend a New Testament canon than any ancient Greco Roman literature in the world. Masses and masses and masses looking at the manuscripts, looking at the church fathers, looking at which books they're quoting, how they're quoting, which was most of my dissertation work, is how were they quoting? Do the words of Matthew in our Greek text today look like the words they're quoting from Matthew in the late first and early second century? Are we quoting the same text? Uh, That's what we're looking at. And the more I study that, the more I realize that the text of the scriptures that we are quoting today is the same one those that the apostles' churches were quoting from. They're the same ones that those that were trained by the apostles were quoting to the churches. There's no doubt about it. And that strengthens my mind and heart that we do have something. I had a debate recently with an atheist on the subject of the existence of Jesus. Uh, he not only is an atheist, he doesn't believe Jesus existed. Um, and in the Could argumentation, that be, uh, I, is that Richard Carrier you're talking about there? No, I did. I was on a program with Carrier uh, two weeks ago. Actually, he and I did a program on Daniel together on whether Daniel was a forward. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, yeah, but uh, no, this was Godless Engineer, uh, who is a follower of Carrier. Um, and one of the things that was brought up was I used the ex- illustration of Socrates and Jesus of Nazareth. Neither one ever wrote a document, but their followers and eyewitnesses did. And in the opening, in the introduction, you can find that debate on YouTube uh, against Godless Engineer. If you go to my opening and look at my slideshow presentation, I show that when you're looking at Socrates and Jesus of Nazareth, you come parallel. You have the same situation. A guy who was m- martyred for what he believed, he had followers and students, some that liked him, some that didn't, who wrote about him later and journaled his teachings and so forth, Plato, Xenophon, uh, Aristippus, and others. You look at these guys and they're, they're documenting a man's ministry, so to speak, or his philosophy, teaching, student, uh, stu- uh, teacher-student relationships. And if you look at the reliability of the existence of Jesus and what he said, we have far more documentation, far more reliability of the person of Jesus and what he said than anything close to ancient philosophers like Socrates. Um, and, And this is something that was stressed. Like, for example, you look at Xenophon who wrote extensively on the life of Plato, or or excuse me, on the life of Socrates, and then Plato also writing. But Xenophon, if you look at the manuscripts of Xenophon, the closest manuscript we have to the original timeline of Xenophon's writings, it's almost 1,500 years after. The earliest Greek manuscript of Xenophon that gives us an idea of what he said was 1,500 years after he lived. You look at the Gospel of John, for example, who wrote about the ministry and life of Jesus. I think uh, John's Gospel was written in the 90s, early 90 AD, potentially in the late 80s. But I believe John's Gospel was written by him at that later time. And we have manuscripts at the end of the second century of John's Gospel. We're within 100 years of the original. 
compared to Xenophon. So we have documentation that can take us to a closer timeline of the existing writer. And we have far more in number, not just in Greek. We have over 10, almost 10,000 Latin manuscripts of the, of the New Testament. And again, this is the whole New Testament. So hear me carefully so your audience doesn't get misled. But most of our manuscripts of the New Testament are of the four Gospels. Um, and then Paul's epistles. And the least amount is the book of Revelation. We have just over 300 in Greek. Uh, but you, you look at all of these accounts. You have it Coptic, and Syriac, and Georgian, and Armenian. And you have all these different languages representing the four Gospels across the world, circulating the same four Gospels. You have people who are eyewitnesses teaching others, and they were writing about it. You don't have that for Socrates. So the conclusion is we have a historical Jesus who had historical eyewitnesses who wrote historical accounts that far surpasses anything. And if we deny Jesus existed and we deny and, and, and that his eyewitnesses were forging and lies, hallucinating and all this other stuff, and that all these documents were just fabricated, you're talking about a global conspiracy that would have conspired this to the point of getting it into every language of the known world where the gospel was going, uh, all off of hallucinations and fabrication and forgery. Whereas you talk a guy like so Socrates, for example, he was only known at that point in Greece and his followers were much less than the amounts that were of, uh, in fact, some of Socrates people couldn't stand him. They thought he was polluting the young people with brainwashed ideas. So, I mean, when you're talking about if we deny the existence of Jesus, his eyewitnesses and their documents, then we don't know what Socrates said and if he existed either, because we have far more, far more for Jesus and his teachings than anything Socrates ever produced. But you will not see that standard held accurately and consistently in history by those in the atheist crowd when you're comparing the two, because the criteria is the same, the same historical criteria. Uh, look when looking at the documents and Jesus himself. You're making me want to go back to school. Good. That's yeah. great. Like it's a, do. This is amazing because, I mean, I don't know any of this stuff. I don't even know what this canon. You guys keep saying canon, and I'm like, what is what You is might that? have been having your hamburger when that was going on. Well, I had to make the wife hamburgers. You know, she <laughs> didn't run the grill very well, so she totally went out of milk. Just as a quick review, a canon is a collection of authoritative uh, literature, books, sources, uh, or accounts. So anything that's a collection of something that was written and authorized by the proper pers personnel. <clears throat> all right, that's awesome. But I mean, it's crazy that like all these people, Socrates, you know, all these people, oh, in the history books, yeah, we'll just put that in there, teach it to everybody. We'll put in that in the public school system. Yeah, but we have way more documenting Jesus actually than all that that i'm well, happy to hear that it's amazing to know and across the world not just in one country yeah uh, all, and, and global conspiracy have, before facebook yeah. that's amazing. that's what it would be it would be a global conspiracy in the ancient world with no technology no phones no email no youtube it would take a global conspiracy to pull off what the new testament pulled off and that's amazing. I thank you very much for sharing this knowledge with me. Yeah, no problem. That's amazing. Yeah, I know you. Uh, your your time's about up. It's six thirty. So okay. Uh, yeah, for yep. us. So I don't want to hold you <laughs> over time. Um, but this was phenomenal. And I mean, if you'd be interested, we'd probably love to have you come back and talk more about this, or maybe talk about you know biblical reliability, some other stuff, whatever you would be interested in talking about it. we'd love to have you back and i don't want to keep you over your oh, sure no I, I, I appreciate that stuff too maybe have a little more knowledge when i come in here so i know like what a canon is and <laughs> <laughs> no anytime guys just hit me up i've um you know find the time on the calendar to make things work and uh it was good good to be here i appreciate the uh, invite hopefully your listeners will will gain some insight from it that'll be helpful yeah, and I think they will as well as we did too. So, but yeah, Stephen, thank you so much. Would you mind telling our listeners maybe a little more about like where they could? I know you mentioned it earlier, earlier, but where could they find you and um, maybe follow you and see what you're up to? Sure. Yeah, I'm on Facebook. I mean, uh, Stephen Stephen Boyce, S T E P H E N, and the last name is B O Y C E. Um, you can follow me on Facebook also. Um, 
you know, I look up City Light Seattle Church or City Light Asheville Church, either one of their websites, you'll find me uh, in uh, numerous articles and blogs I've written on this subject, New Testament reliability, Old Testament reliability, uh, m- multiple uh, documents I've written on the Gnostic Gospels. Uh, I've written on the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Peter. I've done my own translation of the Gospel of Peter. Uh, if you, it's it's on that website as well. Um, Gospel of Thomas, uh, the Gospel of Judas Iscariot, um, the Epistle of Peter to Philip. These are all Gnostic texts. If you want to check those out, see what they have to say and why they're not canon. I've they're all on citylightseattle.com uh, and at City Light Singular, uh, citylightseattle.com. Just go to the blog section. There's multiple. I've also done theological ones as well as devotional style uh, articles, but uh, dozens and dozens of articles and blogs on there are mine. Uh, you can read, and there's other sources on there. We have a, a whole team of uh, apologists who write on the history of Jesus, uh, doctrinal flaws, arguments against Barterman, um, and then YouTube. I'm all over YouTube now, apparently, you know, just look up my name. Uh, I've done debates against, unfortunately, the dreaded KJV only TR crowd that I used to be in. Um, and uh, that's where you'll see me and Dr. James White together doing some videos. Um, I was also on the dividing line. You can find me on that. I was with Dr. White going over First Clement. Um, just put my name in the YouTube category. It'll pull something up. So um, yeah, lots of debates uh, and, and discussions and, and panels and reviews. So if you want to check those out, you can find me there. Awesome. Thanks so much for that. And we're glad to call you our, you know, we'll be your fanboy now. You know, we'll follow yeah. you and be like, Definitely oh, yeah, Stephen Boyce. Yeah, we know him. No biggie. You know, yeah, we know yeah. that guy. He's very smart. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate your uh, courtesy and, and kind uh, kind remarks, gentlemen. And uh, we'll 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 get back together again. And uh, best wishes to you guys and, and your work for the Lord and, and doing these podcasts. And the Lord will bless you and use you in a big way. Thanks so much. And same right back at you, Stephen, man. We thank you so much for this time. And until next time, this is Rooted in Revelation. Blessings in Christ.